y'all it's me Bria Janelle sports media talent and in arena host for some of the biggest brands and names in sports now listen today is not about me it's all about having a seat at the table what does that mean you ask whether it's talking on the court off the court sports life NIL business and so much more this is a conversation that you're not going to want to miss and I get a chance to sit down with one of the best college basketball players in the country I'll talk about the Big East player of the year check it out right now All right, Tyler, so we're here with AO. This is called, uh, you know, it's a seat at the table. It's a uh, conversation at the table. But before we get to it, I want to go back to the very beginning of how we got to the table, right? So give me your backstory of, like, how basketball came about for you. Who was the first person to put a ball in your hand? Um, yeah, my, so my dad played basketball in college. Um, you know, just growing up, my mom worked the night shift, she, she was working as a waitress, um, and then go, going to school, she was gonna be a nurse uh, during the day. Uh, so, you know, just always being with my dad and my, uh, my brother, he's two years older than me, but I was really young, just going to the YMCA, going to the Boys and Girls Club, playing two on two, playing three on three with my, with my brother and my dad. And you know, those were kind of those moments that I really fell in love with the game. Uh, and then, you know, just taking it more serious as, as I got older and you know, it's taking me to where I am today. So at what point did you know like basketball was a thing that you want to do? Because one thing that we do share in common is like we're both, well, I'm a former collegiate athlete and you still do your thing now, Marquette. But like at what point did you realize like I really want to take this serious? Yeah, it wasn't. I feel like it was later than than most kids. Um, you know, my sophomore year in high school, I was playing with my brother. Uh, he was only getting Division three looks. He actually ended up going uh, Division two. Uh, but you know, I was like. Maybe I could, you know, play basketball in college. I didn't know. Uh, I was just coming off knee surgery. Um, I took it serious, but didn't really see a vision for it. Um, you know, like some kids, maybe when they're growing up, they, they dream to play at a certain school or they dream to play in the NBA. And you know, I, I didn't feel like that was realistic, so I never really had those, those dreams per se. Um, you know, after that sophomore year, uh, going into that summer, I started to get more healthy. Uh, and then the AU scene in the summer, we. We went down to Florida, you know, I started to get some interest. And then later, later that year, uh, actually my junior year, I ended up getting my first offer um, and then, you know, took it from there. But I could have never imagined what, what it's become, you know, the, the journey that, that I've kind of made for myself. It, I couldn't, couldn't have wrote it any better. Yeah. So every Hooper has like that one game that you like, I will forever remember this game, right? So one of my, I would say was my middle school game, right? This is crazy. I dropped 39 points, no lie in middle school. And then I was like, yo, this is where I want to take the game serious. But do you remember what game that you scored the most amount of points in? One, that's the first part. And two, what shoes were you wearing when you, when you scored? I don't remember the shoes, but I remember the exact game what you're talking about. It was, we were at the Boys and Girls Club. I forget how old. I might have been 10 or 11. Carmelo Anthony had like 64 or something <laughs> that day. And then I had a game that night, and I scored the same amount as him in the game. So I always remember that. Well, that's crazy. Okay, so, you know, we had a chance um, off, off camera to have a conversation about your high school journey. And, you know, you talked about getting your offers, but let's, let's back it up a little bit. You had a little extra time in high school to really develop you into the person as to who you are today and just help with your decision-making process. So kind of walk me through what your high school experience was like. Yeah, so, you know, I grew up five minutes, uh, five minute walk from my high school. Uh, my dad was the school resource officer, so you know, I was always, he had, he had the key to the gym. We were always in the gym working out. Um, and, you know, so I spent three years at, at, at public school. Um, you know, I had a great experience. I mean, public school, it, it is what it is, you know. Yeah. You're not really held accountable to kind of grow up and mature until, you know, maybe your senior year, then you, you start realizing that there's certain responsibilities that you have to have. But 
you know, so after my junior year, I, I decided to go to a boarding school, St. George's um, in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, repeated my junior year again and, you know, just living away from home and, uh, you know, having to make my own schedule, having, having to, you know, make my own workouts and, and you know, eat when, I, when I'm supposed to eat, uh, do my homework when I'm supposed to, you know, all on my own without anybody telling me what to do. Is, that really prepared me for, you know, my next steps because I had those two years and then went right to college and felt like it was a really smooth transition into college. So talk, when we talk about the discipline, because I think something that we both share in common is we are private school kids in a sense, right? So I went to Greater Atlanta Christian, which is a private school in Atlanta. And I feel like it provided me a sense of discipline because we played somewhat of a national schedule. So it wasn't like, oh, we play uh, the local, you know, the high school down the street and then we go play somebody else. It's like, no, we were traveler, right? So you had to grow up faster, you know, than you would say the average high school, you know, kid would do. Talk about your experience and how you think that had helped you, not only on the court, but off the court. Kids, they don't, they don't really grow up in a sense like you were talking about until they get to college. Yeah. Like you come into college, you're like, oh, I got to do this on my own. There's nobody holding my hand. Mom isn't doing my laundry. You know, she, she's not, you know, dad isn't, you know, coming to the gym with me or telling me to go work out. So it's, you know, since I had those experiences from a young age, I feel like it was a great foundation for me to, to kind of take with me and, you know, I was, I've always been a driven kid, but once I was really on my own and really saw, you know, really took the game serious, then, you know, my drive and passion started even more. Uh, and then, you know, get coming into college, I was already, I was already driven. I already had the habits of doing it on my own, of uh, getting everything I needed to get done, done. Uh, so, you know, once I finally got there and, you know, all these, all these kids now that they, they build the habits too late. And then, you know, by that point it's, it's over with. Yeah. And, you know, so we, we flash forward, right? Junior year comes, right? Very special year, it seems for you, start getting your offers. Talk about this, you know, the recruiting process, right? Because I remember going through this process and I'm like, this is probably the most stressful time of my life. You know, you've been a kid trying to make these life decisions and people ask you, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you choosing that? How was your recruiting process? And let's take a deeper dive into that. Yeah, so I actually got my first offer. I remember I was walking home from school. I was right in my backyard. And I got a text from from the coach. Um, you know, maybe that's not how you want to get offered from a text. But <laughs> and I was I was big on that. You know, in the recruiting process, communicate how coaches were communicating, who was communicating with me. I didn't really want you know, maybe an assistant to be communicating. I wanted the head coach to really want me, and I wanted to feel like I was his guy. And so going through that process, there was there was some schools that that I felt did that, and and some others that didn't. That kind of you know, I took less serious, um, but. It is, it is a crazy process. I mean, every every single day you're getting three, four, five calls. Um, you know, these, the coaches are just doing their rounds. They're just checking in. They got a list of guys that they got to call. So they're, they're just going through the list, um, checking a box per se. But, you know, it, I feel like I, I really built some deep connections through that because some, some guys aren't just checking a box. They're actually, you know, wanting to do their job and wanting to really build a relationship and connection. And, you know, my... I, I had a final five. It was um, George Mason, Holy Cross, uh, Elon, uh, Vermont, and I think it was the last one was Richmond. Uh, but you know, those, those all those schools, you know, the head coaches really wanted me, and, and they really prioritized me. And you know, so uh, but it was actually a funny story because the coach that I actually committed to at George Mason. He coached my AU coach uh, in college as well at Williams College Division Three. They won a national championship together. So, you know, he, he really did a good job prioritizing me and, and building a relationship not only with me and my coach who he already had that relationship with him too. So without naming any schools or, you know, giving going too far deep into details, uh, what was one time that, or I guess or a short story that you could share with your recruiting experience where you're just like, yo, this is crazy. Like if it was an ex if it was on official visit, unofficial visit, you know something where you're just like, I never thought this would happen. Don't go Yeah, um, there's actually this family picture that we have. Um, it was after my freshman year at college. It was when I was in the transfer portal, um, and it was Coach Shaka Smart, uh, my coach now. He was calling me. It was actually my birthday. It was the first time that he he had ever called me. Uh, just you know, try, trying to introduce himself, extend an offer. Uh, and there's this family picture, everybody, my mom was bringing everybody in together and I was on the phone and I'm talking to him in the picture when I'm on the phone. So it was just, this is a funny thing to look back to now, you know, when after all this stuff has happened. 
So what about you? You, you have any funny stories when you were recruiting? I, I do, uh, which is, and I, always, I love having this conversation. So when I went for one of my official visits, uh, the school shall remain nameless, um, but I, we drove there. It's probably about three or four hours from where I live. And we went to a game, you know, you, you, you get a workout in or everything else like that. Two, I have two stories, actually. Um, first one, when I got to the school, I was like, I knew this was the school that I did not want to go to when four of the girls had tore their ACLs, <laughs> like back to back to back. And then the school sat in front of a graveyard. And I'm like, I don't want to get up every day, look out my dorm room and see, or my apartment and see, you know, like tombstones. So that for me was like, uh, nah, that, this isn't it. And the funny story um, was when I went to Mars Hill for an official visit. So my mom came with me. And uh, if you know about Mars Hill, so it's a Division II school in North Carolina, so a smaller school. Um, it's in the mountains, like probably 10, 15 minutes from the highest peak in the Blue Ridge Mountain. So elevation is an issue. Me being from Atlanta, my mom, you know, living in Atlanta, we, <laughs> we go on there. So if she stays in the hotel, I still in campus. So this wasn't until after the fact. So she was like, you know, I thought I was going to die <laughs> on your visit. So apparently, my mother not knowing that there was elevation, thought she was having a heart attack, but not knowing <laughs> that she couldn't breathe because of that elevation and being in the mountains. So it was just like, that would have been a heck of a visit, literally, to go there. And it's like, well, you know, I come back and my mom does it, you know? So just like, one of those things. So she's like, she calls down to the front desk. And they're like, yeah, and, you know, a lot of people have uh, problems with breathing and everything else like that. Because she was like, I was already called 911. I'm like, how do you explain I go on an official visit and then my mom's like in the hospital because <laughs> she can't breathe. So I would say that was like one of my like funny or interesting stories. I always tell people, I'm like, I want to visit mom thought she was going to go to a hospital. But um, so yeah, so, but that's how I ended up choosing, uh, I mean, outside of all of that, Mars Hill, I really felt like it was a family environment for me, a place that I can grow and develop as a woman and become a better athlete, you know, and a better person, a human being, um, which is why you know, I chose that. And I guess my question for you is going from um, George Mason to now being at Marquette, a lot of times we hear about players entering the transfer portal, right? Um, and granted, you went through very interesting times. Like you, this was COVID, right? And so before we get to your transfer portal, talk a bit, little bit about what it was like just being an athlete during COVID, because I don't think we get a chance to really enter into the mind of the athlete of what it's like. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, really no students were on campus. You weren't going to class. It was all online classes. So I was waking up for maybe a 8 a.m. lift, going to practice, and then I'm done by two or three, and the rest of the day is kind of just sitting around, you know, playing video games, hanging out with my other teammates, because you, know, you weren't really allowed to do much other things uh, you know, or see many other people. Uh, so that was definitely tough on the mental health uh, side of it, but you know, I, I feel like I really grew that year as a basketball player and, and, and as a man just because that's the, the sole thing that I was focusing on. And it, the COVID honestly really forced me to, to dive all in and go 100% into this because um, there wasn't other distractions, you know. And maybe nowadays or, or at a bigger school, um, you know, maybe a football or a party school, there's, there's a lot of distractions. And, and, you know, that's where kids get lost. And but. So I, it really it really allowed me to kind of kind of dive dive headfirst into this thing. So you know, time goes by. You enter the transfer portal. Talk about your experience and what that was like for you, and and why you decided to go to Marquette. Yeah, yeah the transfer portal is you know like like recruiting all over again. You know, I, I remember I think I entered the transfer portal at 9:30. I got the email that said you're entering, and 9:31 I got my first call from the school. So it's like wow. people, coaches are scouring that thing every second of the day, um, but. You know, it was through, through the transfer process, it's, it's honestly, it's not a fun process because, you know, you're getting so many phone calls. You, you kind of just want to relax. You want to take time and, and think, you know, just be alone and, and really think about your decisions. But all these coaches are, are trying to pull you in different directions. And, you know, it happens so much faster than the regular process because maybe you have two or three weeks in the transfer portal to build the relationships and, you know, make the connections and choose who you really want to go to instead of, you know, two and a half years that you have in high school, the recruiting process starts maybe your sophomore year and you're not committing to a school. For me, at least, I didn't commit till uh, it was November of my senior year. Uh, so, so it happens so fast, which is, which is another tough thing in the portal because you know, if you don't get it right the first time when you had two and a half years, how are you gonna get it right the second time when you got you know, two weeks to do it? But I feel like 
I kind of narrowed my search down pretty quickly. Um, you know, because of going through the process the first time, I, I understood what I wanted. I understood what I was looking for in, in the coaches. Um, and like I said, I was I was trying to prioritize a coach that was prioritizing prioritizing me. So you know, it, I didn't just want. I always say this: I, I don't want to be an assistance guy because the assistant isn't the one putting you in the game. The assistant isn't the one drawing up plays, giving you the ball. It's it's the head coach. So you know, if, maybe if you're not, if maybe if you're on the same playing field as another player, the head coach doesn't want to be wrong. So maybe he'll give you a little bit more leash. And you know, whereas if you're the assistance guy, the assistant doesn't want to be wrong, but he doesn't have as much power, you know, as a as a head coach. But you know, going through the process, like I said talking to Coach Smart, talking to their whole staff. Um, they did a great job with me, building the connection with, with me, my family, my coaches. You know, I'm big on, on really relationships, uh, and that's something that Coach Smart is, is huge on. He, we have this culture document, and our, our three core values are relationships, growth, and victory. And so, you know, I, I saw that and, and was hooked right from the yeah. jump. Mm, so you get to Marquette, you're, work, you're under the tutelage of, of Coach Smart now. Um, Talk about how AEO has just been a vital asset and a resource for you because when you look at the Big East, I like to say you are the face of the Big East when it comes to, you know, to AEO and now what we're looking to do. So talk a little bit more about that and just how it's been a guiding light and a factor for you and been a big help. Yeah, you know, it's, it kind of gives you a, a groundwork. Uh, you know, there's, there's things like the NBA Players Association and, and other things that you see in different leagues. Uh, we're talking about WWE, how they don't, don't have anything like that. Um, you know, it kind of helps you bring together other other people that, that are in your league and a part of you know the organizations that, that you're in. Um, it really gives you a voice for for actions that you want to take. You know, it's hard to go at things alone. It's hard to, you know, take a stand. And I remember there was this kid Geo Baker. He went to Rutgers. Um, and he was one of the first kids who was trying to get NIL, you know, into into the air. And it was already in the air a little bit, paint paint uh paying student athletes, uh, but, you know, he really pushed for it and, and he, he garnered up all other student athletes, you know, everybody who, because obviously if you, you want to get paid if you're a student athlete, so other people would be, would be on board with that. So he kind of, he kind of, you know, gathered up a bunch of athletes and, and made a push for that. And then it happened and he, he got it, he got it done. And I, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of people can thank him for that. And so just seeing what, what he did with that, it really, AO kind of kind of gives me hope where it can bring people together, kind of more in an organization instead of just doing it by yourself. Um, so yeah. So then this is you said the keyword nil. You know, name, image, and likeness, right? So back when I was in school in 2007, 2010, when I played basketball, obviously nil was not even a thought process. It was like, okay, if you sign a jersey, you know, it becomes an issue, right? Or there's a fine, and I mean, it was just so many things. I'm talking about players getting paid and just it being almost like the wild, wild west and like no structure or kind of just like, no, but there was no why to the no, right? So now we flash forward at NIL is this huge conversation that's taking place. What has your experience and journey been like with NIL? And, um, you know, just, just talk about how it effect, has affected you on the court and off the court, because you're not just an, an, a student athlete anymore. Now you become an entrepreneur and a businessman as well. Yeah, with, with our program, Coach Smart likes to say, keep the main thing the main thing. And it's, you know, that, that's, it's super important because, you know, egos can come into place and, you know, money, money is a real thing, you know, so, and not a lot of athletes, you know, this is their first time coming into money because, you know, y y your parents can have money, but, you know, you don't have any financial freedom to, to do really what you want to do. So this is the first time that, you know, college athletes have that in their life. And, you know, for my experiences, I've had a, I've had a couple experiences, but, you know, a lot of, NIL stuff is, is collectives nowadays. It's, you know, you're going to the children's hospital to, to do an event for, you know, our collective is called Be, Be the Difference. Um, so it, it kind of goes off of, you know, our whole school motto is like, be the change. And they don't, collectives don't really want to be, a, or they can't technically be a part of schools and everything like that. But, you know, obviously, you know, there was, there was back doors happening beforehand with, with, with all that stuff going on and, you know, so obviously people are gonna kind of weave their way and then see how close they can get to that line. And, uh, but you know, it, it's been great. You know, I, I think NIL as a whole has really benefited college athletics. You know, it's, it's given people more of a purpose you know, other than just, you know, 
I'm here to play. I'm, I'm here to get better. It's really, you know, I want to do this because I can make a living doing this now. It's not, I, I don't need to do it for a certain amount of time at a certain level to then make a living. No, I can make a living now and doing what I love to do. So what NIL, um, I mean, this is, it's still such a new space and everyone's still trying to learn it. I feel like we see laws and things that are passed or being discussed every day. Like talk about some of the benefits that it's just, it's had for you just, you know, just let's say as a, as a student athlete, when it comes to like, maybe if I didn't have NIL, I wouldn't be able to do this. Right. Because you're surrounded around a great team of people who have your best interest in consideration. Yeah, I'm actually uh, got involved with, uh, I started my own LLC. Um, so, you know, just, just little things like that that I would have never thought of before. Um, you know, I, I started investing with some financial advisors. That was another thing. Uh, so just, you know, having, having some equity, being able to do those different things um, has really helped me. And it's, it's preparing me, like I said before, I was preparing for college and now I'm preparing for, for my life after, you know, trying to, trying to take the steps, maybe investing in different things and, Know, real estate or just kind of trying to expand my horizons on all that different stuff. I love it. And that's so important because, you know, I was having a conversation with my mom. We were talking earlier just about, you know, protecting your name, image, and your likeness. And for me, my name is trademarked, right? So Brie and Janelle. So I, all, as, as important as it is for you all, we talk about your NIL. For me, it's the same thing, right? Because I'm constantly like, you know, I, that's important, right? So I have to go back from a business standpoint and renegotiate some contracts sometimes because, yeah, it was called a pre-existing IP, right? So it's protecting yourself is so important. So when you look at the next level of NIL, like from, be, from being a, a player that's in the fold, what do you see next for NIL? Because, I mean, there's a lot of talk, you know, what projected down the line, but what do you see? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there'll be more regulations coming. Uh, you know, right now it's kind of a free for all frenzy, um, and, you know, with organizations like AO, they can help with that. They can help set guidelines and, you know, it's, it's kind of a template for people to go to and use for, for everybody around the country. It's not just school to school or conference to conference. It's, you know, this is what is set for around the country for college athletics, for college basketball, for college football. So it, it kind of give, gives you a platform to use. I love it. So when you're not conquering the world or conquering uh, the classroom, what are some things you like to do for fun in your downtime that you're like, yo, Marquette is giving me an opportunity to be able to have some fun and do these type of things? Yeah, uh, Marquette's, I mean, Milwaukee's a great city. Uh, there's a lot going on, you know, just hanging out with my friends or going to get something to eat, trying all the food, you know. We're at, we're at a beautiful restaurant tonight. But, but no, I, I, like, I like to go get food, just... You know, hang out with my guys, play video games, you know, keep it simple. You know, I, college athletics is so much commitment and, you know, when you can kind of get away, it's, it's, it's great to, to kind of clear your head and, and do that. For sure. So in your downtime, when you're, when, you know, if you're not trying a restaurant, what, are, what is a cool fact, right? If I were to look on Google or look on any search engine, what's something I, I, I wouldn't see on the Internet that people should know about you that you're like, nobody knows this and you can't Google this about me? Some people say I can't read, but uh, <laughs> no, it was actually a funny story about that. But, huh? um, but no, I, I would say actually in high school, I was in the ping pong club. So wait, ping pong club. Okay. 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 Back. Let me, tell me about this, please. <laughs> so me and my dad, we, or I, actually, so it starts even before that. Um, I always had a ping pong table at my house. Uh, my dad was pretty good. Um, and then in the summers we would go to this pool club. And they always had ping pong and tournaments and everything like that. So I kind of kind of fell in love with it. And it's just you know, something fun to do. And it's, it's like, obviously, like pool or darts, you know. It's something that you, you know, it's kind of a flex to be good at those things because not many people are. But I wish I was, I suck at pool and darts. And ping pong is kind of a little obscure more than those two. Like you're not seeing that at a, you know, at a restaurant or something. Whereas you'll see a, maybe a pool table or a dart table, uh, dart board at a restaurant. But I... Uh, I got into it a little bit in high school. We had, we had the club. Uh, it was like every Tuesday, Thursday, you go play after school. You know, were you competing in any tournaments or were you just like, ah, some idea for fun? Because this is a ping pong club. I'm no, like, no, I, didn't, I didn't take it that serious. It was just, you know, it wasn't like it was a team or anything like that. It was just, you know, maybe 20 guys going to play after school. Yeah. Obviously, you got this meal of us, right? Uh, you, you talked about how you love to eat out at restaurants and on your off day. So what's a typical off day like for you? Like when you're getting work day, you know, get your workouts in versus like game day, middle of the season. 
You guys just knocked off Georgetown. What's a what's a game day like for you? Yeah, there's probably during the season maybe three different days that you could go through. You know, an off day, a practice day, and a game day. Uh, so you know, a normal off day for me, I'll get in the gym, I'll get some treatment. Uh, maybe about ten or eleven, whenever whenever the so our our, our trainers and our, our uh, strength coach do a great job. You know, coming in on off days because uh, you know. They, they know that we want to get our work in, get our treatment in, get our bodies right. Um, so, you know, come, come in whenever that window is. I'll, I'll get a light lift in, get some shots up, and then uh, go take care of my body a little bit, get in the training room. You know, before I, I would probably go back again at night, we were just talking about, but, you know, this year I feel like I've really tried to be in tune with my body, and, you know, I'm playing a lot of, a lot of minutes, you know, practices, it's a long season. Um, so just trying to trying to take it, you know, get my work done, but but not overdo it. Um, you know, just just really be in tune with myself. Uh, so, you know, maybe before I go back to the gym at night on an off day. But you know, now it's you know on an off day I'll just get in once and 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 that's it. But you know, practice day, I'll go I'll get in there an hour before practice, uh, get an individual workout in with with the graduate assistants, um, and then we practice. I'll get some shots up after practice. And then we probably get out around five or six o'clock, uh, go take a little nap, go get something to eat, hang out, and then go back to the gym with the manager at night, probably 8.30, 9 o'clock for another 30 minutes or so. Uh, I, don't, I just, I feel like I always, I always need to be, if I'm not working, I feel like you know, somebody else is, or, or like, I, I, I saw this thing, it's, it's the law of accumulation. So everything that you do, either as a plus or a minus towards your goals, and it's everything matters. It's like not like oh this doesn't matter or this doesn't matter. No, every single thing that you do, it's either a positive or a negative towards where you want to go in life. And so you know if if I'm you know skipping a workout because I want to take a nap or play video games, it's, that's a minus. That's that's bringing me back this way. So I feel like I've just throughout my whole college career and a lot of high school too. I've just been stacking pluses, stacking pluses towards my goal, and and it's worked out for me. So I, I definitely stick with that. So, you know, obviously we hear so much about athletes that invest so much into their body, especially on the pro level, you hear of athletes that are investing millions of dollars into their body. But what has been your area of focus when it's come to your senior season, you're locked in, you're dialed in, taking care of your, not only your, your body, but your temple as well, and making sure that your mental health is great? Yeah, rest and recovery is super important. Um, you know, I, I think sleep is, is major for, for anything that, that you want to do, just having energy and, and living your life that you want to live. Uh, so I, I've definitely taken that more serious. Uh, some supplements like creatine, I, I've been doing that. Uh, tart cherry juice is another thing, kind of helps you with inflammation. So, some medicine that, that my uh, athletic trainer prescribes me. Uh, so just di different types of things that, you know, maybe as a freshman you're not really aware of and you don't really think that it matters. But, you know, that stuff really matters. And, you know, go going to the mental health side is – kind of really getting away from the game, getting away from the gym, getting away from your teammates and your coaches and, and just hearing different people's voices, hanging out with different friends, you know, just, just kind of kind of getting away and, and not, you know, your whole day is basketball. Your whole day is being a student athlete. It's, it's on all the time. And so I like, to, I like to get out. I like to have some dinner. I like to you know, go to the movies, just different things to kind of take my mind off of it. Yeah. So when you look at all, obviously you being a senior and you, you know, this is a big year for you and you look at all the resources that you have available, talk about some of the resources that it's helped you become a better leader on the court, but also in the locker room. Yeah, that's something that this year I've really taken serious. Uh, you know, it started last year, taking on that leadership role. Um, but, you know, this year I've kind of taken it to a whole nother level because you know, that, that's, that's what's going to drive me, you know, what are people going to say about you? He's a leader. He's a motivator. He's a great teammate. You know, those are all qualities that, that I want to be remembered with. And it's, you know, it's not just, yeah, he was a great player. He could pass. He could shoot. He could, no, I want to be remembered for, for all the little things. Uh, and so, you know, since it really started, you know, my, my freshman year, I, I was young. I didn't really know how to lead and how to set an example. Um, and so com coming back, you know, my junior year, I knew it was, it was my team. It was, you know, it was now or never. I needed to do these things in order to, to propel me to where I wanted to go. You know, I ended up doing that, and, and in turn, it, it led to me becoming the biggest player of the year and, and 
you know, our team having great success. Um, so, you know, this coming into this year, I just really wanted to double down on that and double down on my teammates and how they feel about me and how I make them feel, you know, not only on the court, but in the locker room, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the training facility, and when we're hanging out just, just uh, at the dorms. Um, so just doubling down on my guys and, and making sure that they know how much I really appreciate them is something that I've done this year. And, and you know, it's, it's really helped, helped us. All right, so, I mean, we talked about NIL space and obviously representation being so important. Uh, do you have representation? I do, I'm with uh, Priority Sports. Okay, so talk about Priority Sports and how they have been beneficial in helping you navigate through this whole NIL process, being a collegiate athlete, all that. Yeah, having agents is, is very new to all, all college athletes. Obviously, you know, if you're maybe a top five player in high school, some agents come around and try and talk to you early. Um, but, you know, it was something new to me and my coach, you know, we talked about keeping the main thing, the main thing. And that's something that, you know, he really emphasized and it was important to me as well. So having agent, having, you know, people having your back, you know, maybe them having better relationships with different brands, you know, trying to promote you better um, to, to, you know, do it uh, for different NI, uh, NIL deals. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really about building that relationship. Like I always talk, it goes back to that. And, you know, I, I feel like I, I got on a, a Zoom call with them. Uh, you know, they, they kind of laid out a plan for me uh, and re really, really, they had a vision for, for where they wanted me to go. And, you know, I, I took it and, and you know, it's been good so far. I love it. And, you know, I was having this conversation earlier. We were talking off camera. And um, one of the things, I, like, I got to a point where, no, no lie, my mom used to in, read my contracts. Yeah. And then when the contract started getting bigger, it was just like, I don't think she understands anymore what the what, what, what all the lingo is. At what point did you realize, like, yo, I need an agency. Like, I need someone that can help me with everything that's coming my way. Yeah, so after the NCAA tournament last year, um, yeah, my coaches had saw me towards the end of the year dealing with different, you know, whether it be a trading card company or a restaurant or, you know, a bunch of different things that I was dealing with all on my own. And so, you know, like we talked about maybe, our, our parents looking at the contracts, so, you know, one of my coaches looking at the contracts, um, you know, it's all that stuff. It's hard to really decipher if you don't really know the ins and outs of it. So, you know, just, just having somebody to help you deal with that stuff and all the little things that come with that you don't really realize until you're, you're in the fold and, and you're really going through it. So, you know, going with priority has definitely been, been a great choice. So why priority? Because there's thousands upon thousands, but what was it about them that checked the box for you that you're like, there's always that separation, right? Between good and great, right? So I'm sure you had some good opportunities, but what made this not only a great opportunity for you, but the right fit for you? Yeah, the right fit, you know, it was close in proximity. Uh, you know, they're, they're right down the street in Chicago. Um, and, you know, the lead man, Mark Bartlestein, uh, he had a great relationship with Coach Chaka Smart. And so, you know, I feel like everything that I've been talking about is all about relationships and, and connections and, you know, in life, that, that's, that's a lot of what, you know, getting the next job, you know, having this connection, getting the next offer in, in, in basketball. Um, but, you know, so, so they were connect, well connected and, you know, he, he put me on a phone call with him and, you know, we did a Zoom call and I just feel like he, he really had my best interests at heart and, and laid out a, a, a really strict plan on where he saw that I could go and, you know, we just kind of took it from there and ran with it and it's been a really great. Reigning Big East Player of the Year. What were some of your personal goals that you set for yourself that you're like, I haven't really shared this with anyone, but I think that it's very important for people to know. You know, I mean, obviously you have your team goals coming in, right? Things that you guys want to accomplish collectively, but individually. Um, what are some of your team goals that you, or some of your personal goals that you can share? Goals for me have never really been a thing. Like I would say, like we were talking about the recruiting process and the dream, everybody always says, oh, you had your dream school we talked about. It's like, things just weren't realistic. Like I never thought before the year, Big East player of the year. Right, I never right, thought, right, I never right, thought right. that wasn't a goal of mine. It just, just happened. You know, I was, you know, I, maybe I thought that I wanted to be first team all league or, you know, I thought I was good enough to be, but it wasn't like, you know, that that's my goal. I need to do this and, you know, even coming into this year, you know, it's preseason first team All American, preseason Player of the Year, and you know all those expectations. It's, you know, obviously those are things that you want. You know, you you want to be able to play well enough to earn those things. Um, but you know, in terms of in terms of a goal, it's not 
I, I just want to take it day by day and see what, see where I go with it. It's not, you know, my whole life has been, you know, see where I can go with this. And, yeah. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> same. it's the same thing with, with the, you know, the next steps in my career, you know, whether it's the NBA or whatever else is, it's not, you know, the NBA has never really been a goal of mine because it's never been realistic. Like, I, I feel like it's never been something that, you know, in my mind was realistic to, to even think of. Right. And, and, you know, coming closer and closer to it, it's, it's getting more real and uh, more real every single day. Um, so, you know, that just trying to put my mindset, trying to shift it into, you know, th this is this is something that could really happen. Let's go after it is, is something that I've been trying to do. You know, I, I love what you said that what you said there, because I, I always tell people like in my career path, you know, playing college basketball, I realized at five, four, I wasn't going to be a professional athlete. Right. So it's like the thing of the what's next. And I you know, was fortunate enough to be mentored up um, by Maya Angelou up until she passed away. One thing she told me was that my voice had the ability to change nations. Right. And you have the ability to be on the largest platforms every Saturday, every Tuesday, every Thursday, you know, playing in front of the world, really, whether it's on television or, you know, some of the best fans you guys have at Marquette. Um, for you, what's been that thing that you're like, this is my motivating factor as you're pursuing and chasing that goal of if it's the NBA or if it's the next phase of your career, like what is that thing that keeps you grounded, but also that keeps you motivated? Yeah, um, for me, my thing has always been proving people wrong. Like, you know, they said I couldn't play Division One basketball. All right, I'll show you. They said I couldn't play in the A-10. All right, I'll show you A-10 Rookie of the Year. They said I couldn't play in the Big East. And then after my first year, it was I told you because, you know, maybe I didn't do the things that I wanted to do. You know, so, so some people had their doubts. And then, you know, I came back and motivated me even more. Like, all right. I didn't have the best year that I wanted to have. I'll come back again, Big East Player of the Year. So it's like, you know, just those little steps, kind of the, the mini setbacks mm -hmm. uh, for the major comebacks. It's, that that's, that's something that is, <laughs> that's really been my story. It's, you know, everything that, that has taken me a step back has then propelled me into doing all, everything that, you know, I could have never dreamt of. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I love that because, you know, Obviously, I, I feel like I'm in a, the, the, the prime of my career, right? Just getting, just getting started. For you, you know, NBA, NBA is a goal. If, you know, you decide, mm, maybe NBA is not the goal. What's something that you would love? Like, what is your ultimate goal of what you want to do after, when the ball stops bouncing? Because whether it's college, whether it's the NBA, whether it's overseas, where at some point in time, the ball stops bouncing. Like, what are some things that you would love to do and accomplish during, you know, during your time here? Yeah, I definitely want to stay involved in the game. Um, you know, like we, we were talking earlier, how you wanted to stay involved with athletics, maybe even though if you can't be a part of the sport. Um, but, you know, it's the other people around it are just as involved and, and they feel just as a part of it as, as the players are. So, you know, just definitely stand around the game. I'm, you know, maybe coaching, maybe training. Um, you know, I want to really play as long as I can and then take it from there and, and, and see where it goes because I've never been one to, to, to set a plan and to, you know, take these steps and, and walk this path. It's kind of always just take what's take what comes to me. And so, you know, after I get done with whatever, the, you know, the next chapter is, then whatever my calling for that, for that next, next chapter, it's, you know, it'll be there and I'll, I'll know it when, when the time comes for sure. For sure. What are you majoring in? Communications. Oh, that is my background too, dude. Like, seriously, I was like, yeah, I wanted to be a television personality. My mom always jokes like, you started talking at six weeks old and haven't been quiet since, right? It's there's so many different things that you can do in the world of communications. And the great part about it is I always tell people, I didn't see who I wanted to become, so I became her. And same thing for you. Like, if you don't see what you want to become, become that person. You know, don't be afraid and do it unapologetically, right? Because you're doing what you're doing now on the court unapologetically, right? And you can, you know, continuously proving people wrong. But if you had your ultimate job of like, in working in communications of some sort, right? What, what would be like, just, just for kicks and giggles, what's something you would love to do? Because we have the cameras rolling right now. So if anybody's listening, they would know what you want to do in communication. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, you know, front office executive in the NBA, scout, or... You know, I actually, one thing that I love is talking to the, the TV personalities. that they, So they'll come to our shoot-around, come to our practices. Um, so I, I love talking to those guys and... You know, they have great insight into the game because they played or they, they were former coaches. So maybe something like that. And I feel like communication background, that's one of the most important life skills to have, to be able to 
really communicate and, and read people and see how they feel and know how you're making them feel. And, you know, not a lot of people can do that. Not a lot of people have people skills. They're not really personable. And I feel, I feel like I decided to do that because it, it opens so many more doors and, and gives you so much more insight. Yeah. So we ordered some food tonight. Obviously, this is a you know, great conversation. Uh, AO has brought us together. Uh, what are your favorite dishes? Like when you go out, what's your go to that you're like, I'm ordering like I definitely have to have this when I go out? Depends on the style of food that we're going with. Okay. So if we're going Italian, I'd say chicken parm. That's that's one of my favorites. Uh, and then say if we're going, you know, if you go to a nice steakhouse, you got to get a steak. I go steak with mashed potatoes. And maybe if they got like a lobster mac and cheese, I'll go with that too. That sounds good. What do you go with? Oh, you got me with a mouthful. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's see. I'm definitely going to go steak. I love a black and blue steak. Okay. You can never go wrong with that. What's, so what's that? Black and blue. I'm going to put you on game. So it's a medium well steak with some blue cheese melted on it. Life changing. Game over. Put some onions, some caramelized onions, some mushrooms on it. Never go wrong with some mashed potatoes. I, I agree. Lobster mac, undefeated. Hands down. Hands down. And you got to get a veggie. My veggie, I'm going with spinach. Going to be the good one. I love Green the spinach. spinach or like regular spinach? Mm. If I'm feeling spicy, I'm definitely going cream and spinach, but regular spinach on a good day. You know what I'm saying? It's like saute is really good. So, so yeah, but I appreciate you, man. This has been such a great conversation. What's, what's outside of obviously basketball and, and all the things that you have going off the court, what's next for you? Like, what would you like to accomplish in 2024? Some goals you set for yourself? Yeah. You know, uh, we talked individual, we talked team, you know, I, Last year, we didn't do what we wanted to do um, in the SJA tournament. You know, we, we had all of our regular season goals and postseason tournament goals within our conference. But, you know, we, we really didn't do what we wanted to do and, and show what we can do in, in the SJA tournament. So, you know, we, we want to win a national championship in 2024. 2024 and, you know, we, we have April 8th circled on our calendars. That's the, the last game of the year, and you know, we want to be playing in that. So that's definitely the goal. This has been an awesome conversation. We've literally had a chance to have a seat at the table. We understand now how you got to the table, right? And I wish you the best of luck, man. I am rooting for you every step of the way. Best of luck the remainder of the season. I can't wait to see you on stage, you know what I mean, during March Madness, holding up the trophy. Uh, congratulations on all of your success, and there's more to come, man. I appreciate you. Absolutely, absolutely.